You know, 100 years ago, I was working my way through college. I went to work for a civil engineering firm, and, and um, I think I was in more manholes than legally should be allowed for someone that age. Uh, and that was before confined space ever came about. There's only one person that's been in more manholes than me in this room. It's this gentleman right here. His, uh, last, for five years, he managed a crew that did nothing but manhole rehab repeatedly over and over and over. He knows manholes really well. He's <sighs> Sam Hunt is uh, tech services director for Madewell. And I think you're going to find he's got a refreshing look at uh, manhole rehab, why it's important. Sam? Uh, thanks, Don, for the introduction there. Uh, interest of time, we'll jump right into this a little bit. Again, I'm Sam Hunt, Tech Service and Sales with Madewell Products Corporation. And we provide a, uh, a an array of lining solutions for um, any kind of underground sewer manhole structure. So, obviously, we want to talk about a few things that are related to I and I, and some of those are going to be why would we re rehab manholes? Every manhole is obviously unique. Uh, you see several different things there, pros, cons. Uh, no matter the type, surface prep is key. And we'll also take a road down inspection and ensuring a good, long-lasting product. So why would we really rehabilitate manholes? Uh, there's many issues in the sewer system as well as I&I. &I. I&I, however, is probably one of the biggest and most expensive issues facing collection systems. So with manholes being a large portion of total I&I, &I, uh, they're also easily to be accessed. So it kind of makes this tool that's in your toolbox one of the cheaper and easier things to do. So. Uh, Rehabilitation of the manholes is uh, just a very simple place to start your journey to I and I elimination. So, along with I and I, uh, you're looking at an array of issues, probably some that aren't mentioned here, with structures that can be mitigated or helped with a liner installation. So, some of those issues being structural concerns. Everybody's seen the brick manhole that's got bricks coming in, maybe actively caving in. Uh, the concrete structure that it's ate out so bad you wonder when it's going to cave in. We've got live loads, traffic, things going over top. So there's always structural concerns in certain areas. H2S and other types of corrosion. Uh, industrial treatment plants. You've got different chemicals being released into into different types of structures that can eat out flow lines and, and really tear up manholes as well as the H2S that everyone knows about. Uh, liners also provide a smooth, visible, easy to clean surface. And then there's always just working on your system in good faith of preventative maintenance. So before we start talking about how we're going to fix every problem, uh, we kind of like to talk about some of the issues that we're up against before we can find that right solution. So one of the things that I like to look at immediately is what type the manhole is, what it's made out of. So you look at brick, block, precast, fiberglass, previously lined manholes. We've seen manholes made out of 55-gallon barrels just whatever people had that they could find to make a manhole with. Uh, flow rates and times can drastically change what process you're going to use, uh, how you're going to apply it. Structural integrity can change which liner type you're looking at or how you're going to apply it. Atmospheric conditions, going back to that corrosion, maybe some H2S in the atmosphere, different things that can affect different styles of liners. Uh, pipe penetration types can also change a few things just by what the pipe's made out of, whether it be plastic, steel, cast, uh, whatever it may be. So these are a few issues that we need to look at each manhole individually before we just write a blanket policy to fix them all. Uh, also, with every manhole being unique, this can also change the application technique. So aside from what type of liner to use, we might also change the way we put that liner in. 
So a lot of different liner types that are on the market can be applied in several different ways and you'll see in a lot of different specifications that they like to word how they are put in. Uh, for instance, if you were lining a manhole out here in the middle of the street, generally any company can do that, no problem. It's right where everybody would expect a manhole to be. If you look out in the middle of a, of a river or ditch that you can't access, maybe only by boat, we might not be looking at spin casting or spraying or any of the fancy technologies. We might be looking at putting it on by hand. So it's always kind of good to look at where your structures are, what type of shape they're in before we write this spec and provide this solution that may not work for all of them. And sometimes this can even change on the job site. You show up to the manhole and it's not what everybody expected because generally things tend to change quickly on a job site. So these are just some things you want to keep in mind when you're looking towards rehabilitating structures. So these are some of the conditions that might be affecting the application technique. Uh, structural condition. So this is one I really like to talk about just because a lot of people don't see it possible or don't think it possible. There, there are several situations where you're looking at, uh, let's use a brick structure for example, that's missing several bricks, cracked, it, you look in the manhole and you just think this is unsafe for anyone to get in. And that's very true in a lot of cases. However, that doesn't always mean that, okay, we just need to ditch the idea and start thinking about digging it up. A lot of these different products can be applied remotely. And keep in mind, with, with the current state of this structure, it has no structural integrity at all. So if we could choose a structural liner to remotely put in it, once that liner is cured, then it would be safe to enter. Uh, usually that's followed up with an engineered design thickness. That way once that liner is cured, it's able to withstand the load of the ground and load surrounding it. So that's another thing you might want to look into, especially in areas where digging is not exactly very cheap. Uh, actively leaking brick manholes. So everybody kind of thinks it's a general consensus that you need to stop all leaks before you apply a liner. I would agree to a certain extent, however, in a brick manhole, if you have a leak in the base of the structure, if you're to seal that leak, you're basically going to just chase it brick by brick until you get up to the water table. So what we like to do a lot of times, or we like to see, is go ahead and prep and line that structure down to the leak and leave the leak alone. Let it go ahead and leak. Once your liner is cured, you've sealed everything else then you can seal that leak and it has nowhere else to go. That's just a, a kind of a simple trick to get around beating your head in the wall trying to seal leaks in a brick mantle. Size and shape can change things as well. Um, there's a lot of different technologies and different application techniques on the market. For instance, a four foot diameter manhole, uh, spin casting or spray application is pretty standard. Uh, now, if you get into something quite a bit larger, large flat walls, that's pretty much going to limit you just to a spray application. You, you obviously can't spin cast something that's not round. So there's, there's different areas that require different kinds of application techniques. Discharge, discharge manholes and heavy flow. So these are a couple of things that can affect uh, pretty much any kind of application that you're doing. Discharge manholes would uh, obviously release a quick flow of water into the structure and it's usually not controlled. Some people already have it controlled. And what you can do in that, in that instance is either regulate your pump times or you can also create a temporary drop inside that structure to divert that flow to the outgoing pipe without actually shutting it down. So there's just a couple of little, little things that can change your everyday application just by looking into conditions. Obviously, we already talked about location and accessibility as well. So, uh, Types of rehab, rehab methods. So let's start looking at some of the solutions that are on the table. Uh, obviously, mainstream restoration mortars. Everybody's got a restoration mortar. Uh, they vary in, in type from Portland-based, calcium aluminate-based, 
pure fused calcium aluminate as well as geopolymers. So we've got an array of restoration orders. Let's talk a little bit about what that means on the next slide. Uh, we've also got protective coatings. Uh, generally speaking, polyureas and epoxies are going to fall into that category. Composite liner, uh, you're looking at mortar with an immediate epoxy top coat. That's one type of a composite liner. Resin impregnated felt or fiberglass or bag liners. And then mechanical liners, which are fabbed and then applied in inside the structure. So this is just a, a general list of pros and cons if you're quickly trying to find a solution for your issue. So restoration mortars, you're looking at being able to apply them in a wet environment. Uh, they're generally structural. They create an I and I barrier, and they can be applied in thick lifts to smooth rough surfaces. They also uh, adhere to concrete well. However, most restoration mortars have little to no resistance to hydrogen sulfide mortar. There's a lot of them that, that come out with, with different levels of resistance. That's kind of a hard battle for me to talk about. I like to see a protective coating go on in place of just a, a restoration mortar that's supposed to handle a certain amount of, of hydrogen sulfide. There's really no way to guarantee what your hydrogen sulfide level is going to stay at all the time. Uh, protective coatings, excellent corrosion resistance. Uh, easy to clean surface when you're done. They've got a high adhesion to concrete. However, uh, they're generally not structural. They're not applied very thick. So if you're in a rough area, which hydrogen sulfide corrosion could, could have caused, it's hard to build that area up to fill all the bug holes in the exposed aggregate. Uh, most of them are not usually very moisture tolerant. So if you've got something pretty wet, putting it on is not going to reap any kind of adhesion. Uh, they just don't like moisture generally. Composite liners, they're moisture tolerant, uh, generally structural, I and I barrier. It can be applied in many thicknesses. Uh, it's got an excellent corrosion resistance and adhesion to concrete. One issue being it's a pretty slow cure. So if you're in certain areas you might be looking for a fast cure near that discharge manhole or underneath a flow in an area where the composite liner may not be a good choice. Uh, cured in place manholes, excellent moisture tolerance, uh, easy to clean surfaces, they're relatively corrosion resistant and they come with a uh, pretty poor adhesion and kind of a high insulation cost as well. Mechanical liners, obviously excellent moisture tolerance. You can bolt them on underwater. They're easy to clean. However, they come with a low corrosion resistance. They're generally not structural and probably a high installation cost as well. So like we've all talked about with different things, uh, surface preparation is kind of key. I don't, it doesn't really matter if you're, you're putting tile in your bathroom or painting your bedroom walls or if you're lining manholes. If you don't follow the steps to get the adhesion and get the longevity, you probably won't see it. Uh, it's, it can lead to failures that have absolutely no relation to the product's performance. We see it every day. Everybody does in the industry. If something's poorly installed, it lasts for a poor amount of time. Uh, generally speaking, the, when you look at prices for products and, uh, to be applied in rehab, you're looking more at the application cost than the actual product itself. It takes a lot of time to clean something up, especially when it's had live sewer in it for years and years. And the application process is what makes something last. Uh, another key to, uh, to the rehabilitation process, uh, inspection both before and after and even during is just a good peace of mind, kind of like Tony's mentioned. Inspection after inspection, it really keeps everybody in line as far as he knows what's going on in his system. The contractors know if there's anything wrong with the products they installed as well as the manufacturers. It just keeps everybody on an even playing field. Uh, st starting with the details and data to build a good plan, as we talked about. Being sure that the application process for the selected type of rehab is followed. 
So in the field, if you just turn everybody loose, you better hope you have a good applicator. You, you generally want to put stop points in, checks and balances, just to make sure everybody's putting in a good product. When the plan doesn't cover the task, stop and regroup for a solution. So instead of just writing a spec and, and saying, here we go, let's go line all these manholes, if something doesn't line up, stopping and looking for the right answer is generally a very good idea. And then following up on past work, I know Naperville does a great job of this. You're uh, bringing questions, issues, defects into the light for everybody involved. No one likes to see an issue. However, we do all like to see it corrected. So if you can involve everybody that's on that job, everybody gets a chance to take care of it as well as give you a better product. Uh, seen it time and time again. You have a product issue and you say, well, I'm never using that product again, on to the next one. And that doesn't necessarily give anybody a peace of mind and a full answer when they get back home. Uh, testing, that's another thing that can create some issues if, uh, depending on which way you look at it. There's a couple of different types of testing. We generally like to narrow them down between non-destructive and destructive testing. So destructive testing would basically be tearing into what you just did to ensure it was installed correctly. Sometimes very necessary. Recommended? I wouldn't say so. Not all the time. Uh, so what, some of the destructive testing things are core testing. <clears throat> so basically drilling a hole into your new liner and bringing out a piece of it, generally used for checking thickness. Dry film thickness test, which once again is drilling a hole into your rehabilitation method. And then pull off adhesion testing. So adhesion testing is one that's used quite often. And the only reason that I, I'm really not a fan of it is because of the fact when you do an adhesion test, you do it on a spot that big in your liner. Say you're lining 3,000 square feet of manhole. Well, at least you know that four inch square stuck good. You know, you don't, you, it doesn't really tell you about much of anything. So when you look at non-destructive testing, there's some of these that can be used in place of destructive testing and possibly even give you a little bit of a better answer. Uh, for instance, we talked about pull-off adhesion testing. Sounding is a, is a great tool to use in place of that. Sounding is basically everybody's drug a hammer over a piece of plywood or over a piece of drywall and you hear the hollow sound. You drag it across the concrete and it sounds really solid. If you can drag this hammer over the liner installed and listen for that hollow or solid sound, that will tell you if it's adhered or not adhered. Wet film thickness test, basically just checking the thickness of your liner as it goes on as opposed to waiting and drilling a hole in it after the fact. Samples taken or created during application. A lot of people will apply their liner on a board or on, a, uh, on whatever they have just to ensure that it cures after the fact. And then you've also got holiday detection. And I want to spend just a second on holiday detection because this is what, this, this, is, a, this is a tool to be used that will save a lot of problems on down the road. Uh, hydrogen sulfide gas will basically penetrate any opening it can find. So when you apply a coating, whatever coating it may be, pinholing allows an area for that hydrogen sulfide gas to enter and keep, continue eating your structure out behind a brand new liner. So one tool we can use to mitigate that would be holiday detection. You're basically shooting electronic current at your coating and letting it find the holes to arc through to the outside. Holiday detection can be a little bit dangerous for the coating just if you were to stay in one spot, eventually you could burn through it. However, if it's done correctly, it'll locate any pinhole, even smaller than the eye can see in all of your coating and allow you to walk away with a sound pinhole free coating if done correctly. So holiday detection is something I always recommend when it comes to any kind of coatings being used for corrosion protection. So I uh, hope you enjoyed the presentation. If there's any kind of questions, feel free to reach out to me anytime. Again, I'm Sam Hunt with Madewell, and thanks for coming. When you were showing your list of manholes like brick and whatever, you 
listed, I believe, previously coated. Yes. Is a previously coated manhole going to be a lot more difficult to deal with than one that was not? It, it generally depends. Uh, he's asked basically if a previously lined manhole and, and you're applying a new liner is harder to deal with than just starting from scratch, if I believe. I don't know. I don't know what I'm asking. So uh, when you look at previous liners, it all kinds of depends how good of a job the last guy did putting the liner on. So if, if the liner is already fully deteriorated or if it's falling off, it's generally not an issue. And this is where it gets a little hairy. Say, you know, 70% of it's still on the structure. Then there's a couple of different ways of going. You can either just remove the whole thing, which most manufacturers like to see, just because nobody wants to start with somebody else's leftovers. So if you were to apply to this old liner, you're only going to have as good of adhesion as the old liner has. So generally like to see them removed. However, if the adhesion's great and the cost and everything outweighs removing the coating, then we look into what type of liner it is, how to bond to it, and how to get adhesion to that liner. So those are the different avenues we have to look at, and generally that's, that's broken down between an engineer and the owner's decision. Uh, however, everybody likes to see manholes just ready to accept a liner as opposed to, to another old liner it exactly exactly it makes it very important so those are some other things you definitely want to look for so I, I want to jump in on that because you you did you did have a slide up there that said good surface preparation is the key exactly I've yet to have a manhole rehab contractor show up prepared to do the level of surface prep that we have in our specifications yeah why is that uh, when you look at that, a lot of things are put together on an industry standard. Uh, generally, everybody shows up with a three or four thousand psi power washer. That's that's what the industry calls for in in manhole rehab. And when you look at different surfaces, you look at different preparation techniques. So a lot of different structures, depending on what type it is, and depending on what your specification is, would require a media blast, uh, any type of acid etching. There are several different types of surface preparation. And personally, what we like to see is a certified applicator. So basically, just no one can go out and buy this product and go put it on. There's a lot out there with our applicators we keep them certified and if they're not providing the right level of surface preparation or not installing these liners per manufacturers and engineers recommendations that's how we can maintain control over that basically if someone is to show up and put in a a subpar application technique we can remove that certified applicator certificate from them to where they can't apply our products anymore that seems to be a good way to mitigate a lot of bad surface prep is one providing the training to do it correctly and two monitoring how that work goes on out in the field so we uh, holiday testing is that something the contractor should perform or is that third party or manufacturer? How do we look at holiday testing? So generally, it's, it's put together several different ways. I've seen it in specs all different ways. I've seen municipalities that wanted to provide their own. I've seen third party required, and I've seen contractors required. If it were me, third party's bulletproof. Uh, also, you can always see a lot of certifications in place for that so maybe not necessarily just saying we the contractor needs to provide holiday testing maybe the contractor needs to provide NACE certified coating inspection or it needs to provide you know a, a certain professional level of coating inspection that's going to mitigate a lot of that contractor turning the machine off and going ahead and doing his testing you know so there's a lot of ways around any kind of spec you write. Uh, 
But that inspection before, during, after really keeps everybody on the same page.